Welcome to my talk. I'm Teresa Warmke. I'm here to talk about uh, how to make your own decisions about healthcare products. Uh, you know, um, I'm all for obsoleting the FDA, but <laughs> you know, it, it would probably take a while. And um, one of the most important factors in that is to uh, help people really think about uh, healthcare products and uh, not just tr trust that if it's uh, something their doctor recommends because it's approved, that means it's good. And so uh, my talk is really to, to explain uh, some of the ways that you can think critically about data you see and advertisements you see about healthcare products. Um, I'm also with Free Aid, uh, just like Stephanie, and thanks for, <laughs> thanks for your kind words, Stephanie. Um, it is a pleasure to work with uh, Free Aid. We are an organization that has uh, you know, that networks with a lot of medically skilled liberty lovers, and we've got about 50 members of our Facebook group now, and I'm, I'm delighted. Uh, Chip is one of them here, and, um, and Stephanie and uh, several others. Um, and we're here providing first aid services as well for the festival. So far, we haven't had anything too serious, as I know. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so that's great. Um, and we are, I am also going to be doing uh, CPR workshops at one o'clock today and then one o'clock on tomorrow as well. And uh, it's, it's also very refreshing to see how many people were interested in mutual aid for Stephanie's talk earlier. And CPR is a good example of, of mutual aid, people helping each other without having to, uh, you know, being empowered to help each other without waiting for government providers. So, um. all right, so, uh, some of the things to look for in a health study to summarize. Uh, is the study design appropriate for the question being asked? Uh, is the study well conducted? Uh, were subjects informed of risks beforehand? Uh, it's very important ethically. ethically. Um, how strong are the results? How generalizable are the study results beyond the study population? And what percentage of patients benefit from the treatment? So these are all important questions to ask. And just to pull, you know, how many people here have either had a procedure or a prescription drug or a loved one that has had a procedure or a prescription drug? Uh, you know, how many people here have, um, have really looked into some data about their products? Good, good, excellent. I always do. I know too much. I work, in the, I work in the medical device industry and I just know too much about what FDA does and doesn't ask and, and uh, how data can be interpreted differently in different circumstances. So I'm here to help, help provide more information about um, uh, how to ask good questions about the products that you or your loved ones receive. Uh, so there's two primary problems with uh, healthcare product data. One is confounding. So uh, what that means if, if, if choosing the treatment or exposure is related to other causes of the outcome, you might see a spurious relationship. So uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this in upcoming slides. Uh, and bias is that if the assessment of, of the exposure and outcome are related in some way, uh, you might also see a spurious relationship. So I'm gonna talk about each of these in turn. So confounding, an example of a confounding error is uh, you're looking at the relationship between coffee consumption and cardiovascular disease. If people who consume coffee are more likely to have unhealthy lifestyles, um, maybe they smoke, maybe they don't exercise very much, uh, then you might end up not making the right conclusion uh, unless you control for that, uh, those confounding variables. And then uh, another example, is uh, it can work the other way as well. If you're looking to see if taking a multivitamin supplement uh, will help some kinds of cancers, uh, and people who take vitamins also have healthier lifestyles, you, you might see a confounding relationship that isn't causal. You might make a conclusion erroneously that taking vitamin supplements helps prevent cancer, but it might be related to all these other variables that are going on um, in that study. The other type of problem is bias. And uh, that occurs when there is mismeasurement of some kind. Uh, and uh, when there is poor measurement in both the uh, exposed and unexposed uh, populations, then uh, that can dilute a true effect so that you wouldn't, wouldn't see an effect that really was there in some cases. And in other cases, when there is different measurement of one outcome versus another uh, or, or to, to the exposed population and the unexposed population, 
then uh, it can make it seem like there is an association when it's not really there. Uh, an example of different types of biases, uh, recall bias. So this is kind of well understood. Uh, people with the outcome may be more likely to over-remember. Uh, those without the outcome are more likely to forget. So uh, it's, uh, it, you know, the example we're giving here is cell phone use. If someone develops a brain tumor and, and is asked, you know, about cell phone use, they might remember, oh, yeah, I used cell phone. But if they don't develop a brain tumor, they're not likely to remember that at all. Uh, ascertainment bias occurs when assessment of the outcome is different between the exposed and unexposed. So, um, for example, hormonal contraception and embolism. Women who use uh, birth control pills may be more likely to be screened for embolisms uh, because of more frequent contact with doctors and concerns about the association. And uh, the more you screen for it, the more you're likely to find it. So that's uh, an ascertainment bias. And then another type of bias that ha happens a lot in uh, healthcare product studies is loss to follow-up. So if you're doing a study over a period of time, uh, the patients uh, who, you know, usually there are predefined intervals at which they're going to be measured for different outcomes. And if uh, what happens is that some of the patients drop out, they don't want to continue the study or something else happens, and uh, that's not always uh, random the way that happens, you know. So, uh, if a drug causes serious side effects, more of those taking the drug may drop out than those who don't take the drug. And so then the results might look better than they are. And uh, yeah, so that may look like there are lower risk of adverse events in the group that dropped out. Um, so here are some ways to control for these problems. Um, one of the best ways is randomized controlled trials. Not all health care products go through randomized controlled trials, but uh, the it really helps uh, eliminate some of those issues. Randomization from a treatment group and a control group really helps control the confounding variables um, if they're really randomly assigned across a population, uh, you know, to ensure that the comparison groups are similar on all characteristics other than the measurement, other than the thing you're measuring. So that's important with randomization. And some randomization schemes are better than others. So, um, you know, if, if you look at a study, be sure to think about that. Uh, and then uh, the control group, uh, you, make, making sure there is a control group, uh, has to be adequate. And uh, for drug and device trials, uh, if there is no known effective treatment, new treatments are tre tested versus placebo. But if there, is, uh, if there are other treatments for the condition right now, like for instance blood pressure or something like that, there are currently effective treatments for that, uh, you, have to treat it, you have to test it versus the standard of care. Uh, and um, it's tricky because sometimes the standard of care can vary by location and um, in different countries and you name it. Uh, blinding is another method to control for some of these issues. Uh, it's used to prevent bias. And uh, if patients know they received an active drug, they may be more likely to report improvement. It's uh, kind of known as the pl placebo effect. You know, they're more likely to um, report improvement, and they're also more likely to report side effects if they think they have the active treatment. But if patients know they received the placebo, they may drop out of the study, uh, and uh, they may decide to take the drug on their own, and it can cause issues. Uh, and if a researcher or um, evaluator knows that the patient received the active drug, they may be more inclined to see improvement. And uh, but one of the issues is you can't always blind uh, subjects or researchers. You know, like if, you're, if it's a really invasive procedure, um, some kind of surgical procedure or something, it's really not ethical to uh, do a sham and not really do it. You know, so it, it can be really difficult, but, um, but blinded studies are generally more free from bias than others. Uh, some of the limitations of randomized controlled trials uh, the study population is usually very specific, so you're trying to isolate the variable in question, and so generally they, they get, you know, pharmaceutical companies and medical device companies try when they do randomized control trials to be, have a very specific population that might not always be applicable to the broad population. You know, this happened with Vioxx, for example. They studied a very narrow population, and then it got used for a lot of different things that weren't always well studied. 
uh, randomized controlled trials should only be conducted when there is a state of equipoise. Um, there's a legitimate question as to whether the treatment is beneficial or not. Uh, if, um, you know, there has to be equipoise between the uh, treatment group and the control group to make it ethical even. Uh, you can't conduct a trial where a drug with known w effectiveness is withheld. Like when I was talking about blood pressure earlier, it wouldn't be ethical to set, tell people, you have to stop taking all your meds so that we can study this new one. Um, that's not appropriate either, uh, if it really is standard of care. Although some blood pressure medicines are better than others. Let me put that caveat out there. <laughs> um, and you can't conduct a trial that's where exposure is likely to be harm harmful to a subject. Uh, so you can't assign someone to start smoking cigarettes to study the effect of it. Uh, and um, another example of this is like the, um, the defibrillator that we have at Free Aid. Um, I worked at the company that made it. When we designed it, we made the waveform extremely efficient so that it could be in a small device, that portable like that one. And uh, it was um, so not according to the standard for defibrillator waveforms. And we were able to do a clinical trial at that time because back then, when people were receiving implantable defibrillators, it was uh, standard of care to um, put them into ventricular fibrillation to test the implanted device. But the implanted devices are so good right now that, um, that they no longer need to do that. So no one ever gets put into VF anymore, which is a good thing. <laughs> VF is not a good thing to be in, <laughs> even when you have a defibrillator right there that um, you know, is going to bring them out of it. But um, because of this, it's not possible to innovate new defibrillation waveforms anymore. Because um, in the case of uh, an automated external defibrillator for cardiac arrest, cardiac arrest doesn't occur often enough to study it. It would be impractical to conduct a study of AEDs, and then there are also informed consent challenges. The victim is not responsive, and so in its it, moments count. So it, it's really difficult to do research into defibrillators. And so, um, so right now it's very difficult to study this, and it's not a problem I have all the solutions to. <laughs> it's something I, I'm very interested in talking about. How do you, how do you handle the situation when um, you need to get informed consent for a experimental therapy when the patient is unconscious and their loved ones and um, whatever are not likely around or can really understand in the short time that you need to go ahead and, and try to innovate. So it's, it's a real challenge. That's not going to be solved by getting the government out of the picture. They, they struggle with it too. Um, but I'm glad, I'm glad we were able to study <laughs> the waveform that's in our defibrillator. It would just be nice to be able to innovate further in the future. Uh, so when, when a randomized controlled trial for these various reasons aren't possible, uh, observational studies are generally used. And uh, what happens is that the treatment is not allocated to subjects by researcher, but chosen by individuals. So they, they decide if they want to have the treatment or not. And then, uh, so the limitations of these is bias and confounding, because uh, you don't have uh, the randomization that solves for the confounding, and you don't have the um, uh, control group. Uh, it's just, just people. You're just looking people that are taking the product. But one of the things I, I didn't put on here, but one of the things with observational studies that can be helpful is if you can see that they predefined what they expect to see in the population that took it. So when you, um, when a researcher predefines the outcome they, and the hypothesis that they expect to see, then uh, that really helps minimize some of these things, but not completely. <laughs> there are different types of observational studies. A cohort study is where researchers select a population or a cohort and they assess their level of exposure and then follow them over a long period of time and, uh, uh, and to see if they develop the outcome. There are others where it's a case control where they uh, select a group of people with an outcome and a group, and a group without, sometimes with a historical control, and, um, and then compare the levels of previous expo exposure in both groups. If you're using a historical control, a good question to ask is what was the standard of care at the time that, hi that historical control population was exposed to the product? Uh, before, and because it can change over time quite a lot. Um, practice of medicine and all kinds of things can change. And, and or if it's in another country, then the, you know, the, the, better that, the better that you control 
the better that you match your controls, the, the better off you can be. Uh, ecological observational studies are where researchers select populations, not individuals. Uh, and uh, my, my colleague, uh, Mariko Geiger, helped me put these studies together. And she's an epidemiologist. And I had never heard of this before, but she knows all kinds of interesting things. Um, and uh, so an example of this is the effect of bicycle helmet laws on the rate of head injury. And these studies can be pretty severely flawed because they're looking at groups of people. And there's a lot of confounding stuff that goes on with it. And you know people want to see that bike helmets help. And so it has all kinds of biases, too. Uh, so now moving on to interpretation. So when you're looking at an advertisement uh, or you're looking at a study, you know, or, or if you're like me and you see an advertisement after a doctor recommends something and you look it up on Google and you look for scientific papers, uh, you'll see different things reported in those papers. And uh, statistical testing, you know, I took a class in statistics in college and I just kind of, it was really difficult to understand how to apply it. But after working in the business for so long, I've gotten, I've gotten to know a few things um, working with my statisticians that I work with. Uh, so t testing statistically is based on the possibility that sometimes associations are simply due to chance. And so if a statistically significant relationship is found, it's unlikely that the relationship is by chance, but it is still possible. Uh, there's always a chance that, um, that you saw a good result that was just based on the fact that there weren't quite enough people to be sure that that was right. Uh, when a study is looking at many different comparisons, the possibility of chance error is multiplied. So, uh, so when you see a study that reports uh, decrease in deaths, decrease in uh, myocardial infarctions, decrease in lots of different things that they've looked at in the same population. The chances that they're all good is multiple, you know, the chance, if they report all good results, the chances that there's an error in at least one of them is multiplied. Uh, when a study is looking, uh, let's see here, re oh sorry, replication is really critical to scientific inquiry. The more times the result has been replicated in separate studies by separate researchers, the more you can trust it. Uh, and an example, one of the, one of the uh, examples I researched before this talk was medical marijuana. And I was very surprised to see how few studies there are on it. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I sort of expected to see more just based on all the policy talks that go on and all the other stuff. But I mean, problems, Christy. <laughs> yeah, she's asking, can they study? Can they study medical marijuana? What I heard was that um, when I heard one, or when I saw, saw when I researched this, is that there is one. Uh, I, I guess a lab. I don't know. One, one site in the US where you can requisition marijuana for studies. <laughs> and, um, and the studies I saw, I only saw two studies, and they were in very narrow populations and very limited numbers of subjects, uh, a single site, I think, uh, where they um, tested uh, marijuana cigarettes versus non-marijuana cigarettes. And they called it blinded. And I find this <laughs> impossible to believe. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm very suspicious of those studies, um, but I would love to see more. And so, uh, you know, I wanted to see more. There is, um, there's some stuff out there about uh, cannabinol being extracted, That's purified, right. and presented as a, you know, no. Okay, so maybe. Yeah. 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 yeah, and there's plenty of information on that. Okay, so maybe that's what they did, but I, I looked for that in the paper and I didn't see it, so I was suspicious, but it would have been better for them to explain that you could still, you know, that it really was blinded. Uh, but anyway, re replication is really important. I would love to see more medical marijuana studies replicated and maybe not, you know, just in the U.S. it's really locked down, but I've heard other countries like the Netherlands. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do more, uh, do more studies. Um, that's, that's really helpful. And sometimes when you look at medical product uh, studies, you see something called a p-value. And um, if it's less than 5%, uh, which is reported as p less than 0 0.05, uh, the ch uh, chance error, it's considered acceptable, statistically significant. But this is somewhat arbitrary. You know? So I want people to know. They're saying, they're saying there's a 5% chance this, might, this result might be wrong. And so, just keep that in mind when you see things like that. Or sometimes you see p equals 0.0001, you know, quite a few zeros before the one. You can have a lot of 
result is probably right. Uh, but if it's like 0 0.049, you know, you're, you're kind of, you know, they usually would say less than 0.5 in that case. But, um, you know, that's, that, that's sort of a ballpark. And it's not like there's, it's written into our regulation, but FDA never approves something as far as I've seen that's uh, more than 0.05. Right, but can I add to that though? Sure, yeah, Jody. Those might be reported that way, but that doesn't make up for a bad designs, a badly designed study. Very good point, Jody. Jody's saying that uh, even if you have a P equals less than 0.05, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean the result of something you can count on. Uh, because, and, and, and that also has to do with statistical significance doesn't always translate to clinical significance. That's my other point on here. That just because mathematically the result turned out that way, um, because maybe the way they designed it or whatever to do that. Yeah, confounding and bias. Yes, that happens a lot actually. And so that's a really good point to, to think about what that outcome, does that outcome really matter to you? If you're able to show a statistically significant result in terms of mathematically in terms of reducing blood pressure from uh, you know systolic blood pressure from like uh, 150 to 149 you know <laughs> so what you know it's you know that's not very much <laughs> it doesn't really matter um, and another example so an example of sometimes the way you see this um, patients who receive product A had a significant reduction in cardiac death and myocardial infarction compared to patients who received product B. And then you'll see it in parentheses, P equals 0 0.003. I took this off of <laughs> a study I looked at. Um, but you know, a question on that one I would ask is, are there, were, did they adjust for multiplicity because they're reporting both death and myocardial infarction? So I would ask questions like that. Um, a lot of the time they don't. I would, I would even say most of the time they don't. So be aware that even with a significant result like that, if they report multiple things, it might be less than that, really. Um, and then my other provocative question is, would you believe a conclusion that was P equals 0 0.051? This wouldn't get approved by the FDA, but it's probably OK, you know? And so I just want to get people thinking that way. Well, the other, uh, oh, go ahead. Find my the, the other thing maybe that you're going to touch on is, you know, what's the condition? Yeah, what's the case? terminal cancer, I'm going to try you pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if it's controlled diabetes, maybe not so much. Yeah, exactly. That's a really good point. Yeah, it's uh, depending, on, depending on what the condition is, you can really, uh, you can have a different level that you'll accept, a level of uh, scientific rigor. And, and like what I was talking about with defibrillators, you know, thank goodness we have them, uh, but, uh, but it's really hard to study them. And, Thank you, and I will. I will. I will. I will use it if, if you do. So and, and you do. Kind of like organ donators, though, right? It's like your price. Yeah. Is that if you, so you could have that too. Yeah, there are there are some people with do not resuscitate bands. Um, I've even heard of tattoos. <laughs> you know, all kinds of stuff, and I absolutely respect that. Um, but yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, Sharon. There are two more caveats about studies. In a recent issue of Scientific American Mind has an article about professional subjects. And the, peop the researchers are so eager to get subjects, they're not as fussy as they should be yes. about who gets to be a subject. That's a really good point, too. Yeah, Sharon's saying that um, some researchers are so eager to get uh, study subjects because they get not only money for each patient that they include in a study uh, from the manufacturer of whatever product um, is under investigation, but they also, and probably an even more important motivator to think about, is that they, research, they get to be published. And, uh, and that really helps them advance in their careers. And just be careful when you're working with investigators, that, that can be a bias. Uh, in selecting the patients for the group, and and sometimes you know it, sometimes pa uh, papers put it in the fine print, you know that um, you know s some of the subjects didn't have all of the inclusion criteria, but we it, it, and we presented it, and sometimes they'll present the results without those patients, uh, and sometimes they'll present them with the patients, and just be careful when you're looking at that. It's 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 definitely an issue. So yes, question. I think, uh,
Absolutely, and that's a really good segue into my next topic. Here is, um, is uh, the comment here that um, it's really important to follow the money. It's always important to follow the money. If you're seeing a really something that seems too good to be true or something that doesn't make sense to you or the numbers just aren't adding up to you, um, that, or even if they are, you know, uh, just be cognizant of um, where, where people are getting the funding. You know, the funding for virtually all medical product testing comes from the companies that make the products. And that's the only way you can get the research done. But, you know, just be aware of that, you know. They, and they, they pay for, they pay for um, health care also for the subject. So, like, routine follow-ups and stuff. And so some, sometimes people can get free health care if they sign up for a study. And that's to Sharon's point earlier that you can get professional subjects that way also. So there's incentives for them that way. Um, and, uh, you know, that's good. Oh, yeah, question? Uh, I'm just curious, uh, are there correlation between the need for all these drugs and uh, the production of food? And, you know, it's like, what, 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 is, what is being passed off as food? And, like, it spins back around as to why we need these drugs to like, cure these diseases that are being caused for things we're eating. And it's, uh, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not. The the question is about um, foods and and uh, comments on all these drugs that are being used to address issues that are caused by foods and and things like that. I'm I'm actually not super familiar with uh, a lot of the food um, food issues. I know, I know a little bit about um, you know weed allergies and things like that. I do see that. Uh, because you know, medicine has really changed over the last century even, and uh, to where doctors are spending less and less time with patients, and if there is a drug that is purported to be treating something, that's what they go to first, without, because it's hard to get a patient to change their lifestyle. It's hard to get someone to quit smoking. It's hard to, all these things are hard and they take time, and time that um, you know, physicians don't have. And, and the other thing is it's not all their fault. Sometimes they can get sued if they don't prescribe it. So, and and um, because, it's con because that becomes standard of care because it's so easy to write a prescription and, uh, and it's so hard to do these other things that th then it becomes standard of care and then they can get sued if they don't follow standard of care. So um, it's, it's, a, it's an issue for sure. Um, but it's something that the more people that are aware of that being an issue, <laughs> the better empowered we can be to, to help make good decisions and, um, and work on things uh, and help each other work on things rather than always relying on the prescription pad of the doctor. And, you know, some of them are great, but uh, I had a doctor that was fantastic and always took time to do the harder things, and he got out of it because it was hard to be in practice anymore. And I was sad about that. But, and he was an OBGYN, and, um, you know, the insurance for those guys is crazy. Um, so he couldn't make money with the time he wanted to spend with patients. So it was sad. <laughs> um, Anyway, I'm going to go on, um, just have a little bit, one more topic to cover here. Um, one of the things that FDA never makes people report in their labeling or anywhere else is responder rate. And um, this is really important. Um, and it's, it's also important to those of us who care about being individuals versus collectivists, you know. And especially when it comes to cancer medication, chemotherapy. Uh, so... Uh, there is, uh, there is an organization called the ASCO that looks at different chemotherapy uh, drugs, and uh, it's, it's really all over the place. There is no one chemotherapy. There are different combinations of drugs uh, for different cancers and have been studied in various different cancers. And uh, this is an example of something that the ASCO came up with as a tool for doctors to talk to patients with that I really like to see, but I never see it in, in uh, drug product labeling or anything like that. This is uh, what you're looking at here is, um, sorry, it's kind of hard to see with the blue background. I didn't, didn't think about that. But uh, what you see here are the patients that would, would die anyway with or without the drug. The red is the patients that survive anyway with or without the drug with no effect. And this 13 over here is the patients that benefited from the drug. And, um, and the CO was recommending, and this one is, is worse, um, it has only 10% benefiting from the drug. These are chemotherapy drugs. These are nasty drugs. And if you knew that only 10 people benefit, 10%, I'm sorry, 10% of people benefit from it, would you really want to do it? I think that's up to each person to decide. You know, I think some people would say, yes, I'm, I'm willing to go for it. They live two months longer, 
you know, this 10% of people live two months longer with this, taking this nasty drug. Um, I'm going to go for it and try to, try to do it and try to make it. Um, but like, and especially when it's chemotherapy, if it's only two months and only 10%, my goodness, I think I would probably decide not to do it. Um, but this, um, and that's exactly what was going on in this study. And this is something I never see. I never see in labeling. I, I, I'm glad the ASCO is recommending it for tools for communication with patients, but I just, I just don't see it very often. And um, so, uh, so one of the things, uh, I, I, so um, this was actually, this quote, I'm going to read it to you. This quote came from a uh, recommendation saying, oh, chemotherapy drugs work after all. But it's really telling that e even in this article that was recommended and saying how it's proven effective, they even say what the issues are with it that I have with it. While it's true that chemotherapy decreases a woman's risk of dying from her breast cancer, the vast majority of women do not individually benefit from chemotherapy. In, in order to save that one third, in this, in this case it was one third, not a tenth, uh, in order to save that one third, we have to treat most women who segregate into three groups. Those who would have done well without chemotherapy, who are treated unnecessarily. Those who would do poorly regardless of chemotherapy, who are also treated unnecessarily. And those for whom chemotherapy is the difference between life and death. And so these um, standards of care and public policies all recommend that everyone get it. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think everyone would want it if they really knew all the facts. Um, and, cons and the other thing to consider is this conflict of interest, follow the money. Because chemotherapy has to be given over a long period of time, a lot of cancer uh, you know, oncologists set up businesses that would administer the drug. So instead of just writing a prescription, which doesn't have as much conflict of interest, they would buy the drugs in bulk from the drug companies. And, um, and some of them were allowed to have more profit than others by the government. So um, and just think about the bias in that and the conflict of interest that can crop up from that. You know, um, these, these doctors that are recommending a certain drug to a patient, nasty drug to a patient, um, and, and there were studies that showed that there were differences in, um, I, I can't remember the results and I didn't write it down on here, but there are some that um, they were more prescribed that had the better profit allowances than the others. And um, that's just, you know, unfortunate, and I think I would like to believe that most doctors wouldn't knowingly do this, but definitely follow the money always. It's, it's really important to know and think about who benefits from things and do some research online <laughs> before you have to do something inter interventional like that. Yeah, Stephanie? I think a lot of them, I mean, if it's possible to do this subconsciously, have a bias and not even know it. Oh, for sure. Like you said, they, they may not knowingly do this, but actually there's other studies that show um, when doctors have pens and, and merchandise that has logos on it, they're more likely to prescribe the, the one that has the logo. Yes. Yes. So some of them even will like black out those logos and take them off the bags and you know, just use the swag, but not not yeah, I, I have seen a big changes in the industry since I've been I've been working in it for 20 years, and you know there there have been a lot of uh, voluntary agreements among industry associations to get rid of a lot of the free giveaways that Stephanie's saying can cause physicians to have biases. But of course, as soon as the industry decides not to do it anymore, then the government makes it a requirement. That's kind of the way it works. <laughs> and and then they claim that that was all their idea, you know, and that that's generally what happens. <laughs> Uh, so, um, but, um, and, and so there are biases created from the um, uh, giveaways and things like that, but I don't want to, you know, I want to emphasize again that probably the publication bias is even greater. If, um, if these investigators and physicians know that they're going to be able to be a principal investigator and be named on the paper that results from the study, that is very motivating to a lot of them. And so um, be cognizant of that too. Um, some of them are just really... Uh, interested in advancing their careers, getting more patients, expanding their business, because um, that's how they make profit too, you know, um, a lot of them. Um, and uh, and that comes a lot from publishing. And that's what they know. They, the, the Most of the studies that are going on are funded by healthcare product companies. And so they, they would obviously have a bias toward those ones that pick them as the investigator most often. So, um, to conclude, I just want to reprise what I said at the beginning. When you're evaluating a healthcare product for yourself or a loved one, 
uh, ask, is the study design appropriate? You know, if it's an observational study, did it have to be? Why didn't they do a randomized controlled trial? A lot of, the, a lot of observational studies um, are in populations that could well have been a randomized controlled study. Uh, some of them aren't, though, so think about that. You know, are they studying the right outcomes is another part of design, <laughs> you know, what we talked about earlier. Um, is it well conducted? You know, did they, um, did they, were they meticulous in their collection or did they, um, were, were they missing a whole bunch of people at the one year time point and just report on the ones they had? You know, things like that. Uh, did they, um, if it's something like, uh, if it's something like a coronary stent, were they really looking for the right things down the road? Um, really making the right measurements that you can see what's going on? Were subjects informed of risks ahead of time? That's just something that's, you know, rock bottom critical, um, informed consent, you know, some, there was a big uh, flap uh, about a decade ago with some cancer studies that did not adequately inform patients of risks before they did those interventions and um, that's just unacceptable. Um, how strong are the results? Uh, you know, assuming the results are that you care about, <laughs> you know, um, do they report statistical significance uh, and to what extent? Uh, how generalizable are the results is, is the study. You really can't believe that something in um, patients with a certain type of severe, severe treatment resistant high blood pressure, for example, would that be applicable to someone with uh, blood pressure of 140 over uh, 81 or something like that? You know, how, how, do you, how much do you believe that the study population is applicable? And then uh, what percentage of patients benefit from it, like those chemotherapy drugs, you know, what, uh, really think critically about that, because that should factor into any decision in whether you take, what, recommend it to, to someone you care about. So, yeah, I think that's it. Yep. Yeah, Christy. I'm giving class. Oh. <laughs> I generally um, try to go the healthy route first, match, find a natural, whatever. I don't like taking drugs. Yeah, me too. But in the case that I do, I'm probably not going to go through all of this. Have you thought of like creating a third-party um, rating system? Or Absolutely. Because I would, to you know, that would be a place to go. I would love to do that with free aid, uh, and uh, I I know so much about what's available. <laughs> you know, with, uh, with FDA publishes a lot of stuff, and a lot of it is good information. But some of it is missing, and some of it is um, biased. You know, because once they've approved something, they want to defend it no matter what because they don't want to ever admit a mistake. Exactly. And so, um, so there are some issues like that. And um, free aid never accepts government money. We never will. All of our funding has been very grassroots, and um, we really appreciate the generous support of our donors. But I, it's a project that I've listed that I would like to do with free aid in the future. I'm, I'm busy with all yeah. things. <laughs> I was thinking yeah. 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 Everybody. Yeah. They can call you when they need the research. Hey, <laughs> actually, you know, I'm happy. She's, she's saying, you know, you definitely contact us via freeaid.com. Uh, we have a contact us uh, forum on there. Um, I don't, maybe we do have our phone number. We do have a phone number that forwards to, to us as well. It mostly goes to voicemail, but that's another way to contact us. If you have a specific question and want my advice, I'd be happy to help. And, and Mariko Geiger, my uh, colleague um, who works at Harvard um, and the epidemiologist who helped me with this talk, uh, couldn't be here, but uh, she, you know, she and I would be happy to help um, with uh, questions that come in for us. Yeah, Sharon? You want to hear another creepy caveat? What's that? <laughs> My partner, Art, used to work for one of the companies that oversees drug testing, and he quit. He said, you know, I never want to take a prescription drug again after he saw the yeah. hanky panky that went on. Oh, for sure. And I don't know how we learn about that. That's a tough one, but just be aware that not all of these study results are on the up and up. Yes, I totally agree. Sharon's saying that uh, her partner uh, stopped taking, you know, even prescription drugs um, just after seeing all the stuff that goes on after working with it. And, uh, and I do too. I, I avoid drugs as much as possible. And, and even some foods as drugs, you know, like, you know, like I, I have 
avoid drugs as much as possible, whether they're legal or illegal. I don't care if they're legal or illegal. I don't, I don't make that distinction like some people do, and it's something I think critically about, no matter what it is. Um, and yeah, I've, I've seen too much too. <laughs> and, uh, and, and drugs have systemic effects on the whole body that you can't always predict and aren't always measured. So um, it, it, I, I'm a little bit more inclined to get a device if I need one than a drug, just because I can wrap my head around what happens with the device a little bit better, depending on the nature of the device. Some, some device for the nervous system are, are kind of similar to drugs in the way you don't really know what's going to happen. So, um, so that's right. Um, yes? Uh, the legal bar for blood pressure has gone down. Yeah, it could be. Uh, the question is uh, because the 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 threshold for prescribing medications based on blood pressure has gone down. So now it's 140 over 80 uh, is considered the point at which it gets treated. Although it can be lower, like 135 over something, I, I can't remember, I think it's 135 for patients with diabetes also, with, with high blood pressure. But, uh, and she's asking if, um, if that could be the result of pushing from drug companies. Absolutely, absolutely it can. Uh, but look into those results. Look into um, not only, but this is a good example of a surrogate measure. Blood pressure isn't necessarily in and of itself bad. You know, what it does is that there's, a, there's been an association between uh, high blood pressure and cardiovascular events. And, uh, and stroke and you know pretty severe cardiovascular events. So uh, the question really to ask there is, have there been any studies really done that show that you know 140, uh, a blood pressure of 140 really causes a lot of cardiovascular down the road? And uh, there are very few actually, I, as far as I know. Um, there aren't as many as there were in the higher blood pressures. And people just get used to, it is a very good correlate you know, ha having high blood pressure, but I just can't wait to push it. There are a lot of good ones, but um, but when they when there are vested interests in writing a prescription, um, I including publication as well as money, um, then that's what for and, and potentially get a second opinion from someone that's less conflicted. So, yeah. How accessible or readable are these articles? My my level of information that yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jody's asking about uh, how readable are the articles. Some of them are much better than others. Uh, uh, I guess after just having a lot of experience reading a lot of them, I've gotten reasonably good at it. But some of them uh, are written by people with uh, English isn't their first language, and some of them are very heavy in the technical details and jargon, um, and they can be very difficult. I, I agree. It's it's better when companies can translate the results accurately, but you always have to be careful when they do that. There, there are, I would like to give some examples in future talks of advertisements versus the studies and, um, and really show people how they can get warped in trying to make it readable. And then the other companies do much better. Yes? Yeah, TV advertisements. Yeah, it can be, but it, yeah, those TV ads are so weird. You know, they, they yeah, they have all those uh, side effects at the end, and yeah, those are. Uh, it's hard to believe they'd be effective for anyone. They don't work for me, but but yeah, I, I guess they would be. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Uh, yeah, I think. You were generally safer to go with a natural alternative? Not necessarily. Yeah, exactly. I would say not necessarily. That's like, for instance, you know, medical marijuana is natural as they come, but there are very few studies, like I said. So, you know, follow the data, look at the data. Yes. Some of these natural alternatives have not been forced to be tested for purity as much as sure we can get. So you can get a lot of crap. Yes. You can be getting some, you know, 
pesticides from China ground into your ginseng. Right, right. So they're not always as pure. And the other thing about them is that there aren't usually as much incentive for companies to tr to test them. Like there isn't really because it's, uh, for instance, marijuana is easy to grow, and so um, it's not patentable. So who has the interest in studying it for effectiveness? And um, you know, thinking it through, it, it isn't that surprising that there aren't that many studies. You know, there are, um, there really aren't um, incentives for people or organizations with deep pockets to study natural things that can't be patented. So this is another way, in my opinion, that intellectual property kind of hurts innovation and uh, science. Uh, so anyway, yeah, you had a question? Yeah, uh, this is kind of difficult. But we, you know, we hear about people who don't know the authors of doctors. But I'm thinking that there's also a lot of people who perhaps go to doctors. Oh, I completely agree. Yeah, his comment is some, some people don't go to doctors enough and others go to them too much. Um, there, it's well known that certain categories of people, I'll say, um, you know, avoid doctors more than others uh, and are really underserved. Uh, not only poor people, but um, for instance, uh, Black people tend to, it's been studied, uh, go to doctors less, and a lot of it is just mistrust. Uh, after some of the stuff that happened with Tuskegee experiments without consent and things like that, I, it, there are people that are very suspicious of med medicine. And, uh, but on the other hand, you're right, there are other people that you know, either want attention or um, feel like they want to have someone care about them that maybe go more often than they need to. So, yeah. <laughs> Exactly, and that's when the prescription pad comes out, and it's it's, there, it's it's there's a pressure on doctors to give patients what they want. Yeah, I, I think we need to wrap up, or do I have, or what's the scoop? Okay, um, maybe one more question then. Uh, when you get on Medicare, the doctors can't wait to just prescribe anything. Yep. And everything to send you to another doctor and take tests. And it's nonstop, and they have to do it because it keeps the needles Yes. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes sometimes they're important to follow through on, and sometimes they're not. You know, so but there are a lot of pressures like we've been to get the prescription pad out, uh, follow you know follow through on testing or whatever. And but there are sometimes pressures for them not to do it, uh, cost containment pressures that you also have to be careful about. So what are they not pushing on you? And and sometimes referring to other physicians that you might need, um, they have an incentive not to do it sometimes too. So be careful both ways. <laughs> yeah, well you just, I just want people to know that they, you can be empowered. There's so much information available now and um, we're here to help too, like, like Jody suggested with specific questions um, until we get our you know, third party database of, uh, of information out there. Um, you know, please you know, follow through and um, know that you can ask those questions. Can you can start with like, just case studies, things you've researched and just put them up on the free I can. Site. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah that's that a good idea. Turn into a, you know, sure. a database. Yeah, that's a good idea, Jody. Yes, yeah, suggesting that we put case studies up there, what, that'll, that would enable me, because I have a day job as well as doing various types of activism, so, um, you know, maybe uh, we'll do it a little at a time, baby steps. Yeah, that's a good idea. All right, well, thanks, everyone. Uh, don't forget CPR workshop at 1 at the Garden Green. So, thanks. Thank you, Jenny.